the second full time I've seen it, I will, I will tell you that I heard the story and then uh, was at the Super Bowl this past year. And this gentleman introduced himself as Brian Banks. And um, just, you know, how these things come together. As I mentioned, Floyd and Stephanie, and he, 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 you know, I knew who he was and uh, kind of wonderful conversation. And I, I said, well, you know, if you, if you ever make a movie, you should come to Martha's Vineyard. I mean, it was, it, and it was in process. He, he didn't know what was going on. And I will tell you, when Floyd and Stephanie called up, I, I said, this is supposed to happen. Um, so it, it is just in this moment of, of mass incarceration, wrongful incarceration, everything else uh, that's going on. And one of the things that we really strive to do is figure out how to, how to use sport to uh, move messages across. I, I think it's just a wonderful path to, to, to do that. Uh, to further the conversation, um, we're fortunate to have the executive producer, as I mentioned. Let me bring him out first, Terrell Whitley. And then to uh, lead the talk back, my colleague from Arizona State University, a professor of sociology, uh, the author of the book, Black Men Can't Shoot, Dr. Scott Brooks. Good evening. All right, so it's a pleasure to, to be able to watch this, um, Terrell. I think the, the first question I had and in, in when I knew I was going to have this opportunity is, what does an executive producer do? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, let me start by thanking the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival for having Brian Banks. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Arizona State University and the Global Sports Initiative. Uh, I think uh, what you guys are doing and what you've done with for this film. And and I didn't know you guys met at yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah. I actually brought, brought Brian to Super Bowl. So I'm glad that uh, God's hand is always working things out. Um, so an executive producer does a couple of things. Uh, number one, we're responsible to kind of bring together the project financially okay. uh, to kind of help uh, bring pieces to, to bear to ensure that the film can move forward. Um, two, uh, my role is to help position the film for theaters, to get it to theaters. I'm on the, the distribution side and the marketing side of that. And then finally, it's really to oversee the project from beginning to end. Um, I actually came on board during filming. Uh, they, they actually shot the film in Memphis, uh, where Tom Shadiak is from. He's from Memphis, and he, uh, he wanted the film shot there, and, uh, and the, uh, the team agreed to do it. So, uh, and to this day, I'm, I also run a marketing agency called Liquid Soul for the last, uh, now almost 19 years, and we, we've done marketing for 30 number one films, five Academy films, and 150 other films that have grossed $3 billion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we, my agency is handling a lot of the marketing. So if you've seen a commercial, if you've heard something on the radio or billboard, uh, we're, we're all up in that process and we're doing screenings all across, the, across the country as well. So I'm pretty active right now. I'm living Brian Banks pretty much day <laughs> in and day out. Now, before I finish, I also would want to let you know that on Monday here, uh, the festival screened Amazing Grace, Aretha Franklin's yeah. Amazing Grace. Yeah. I don't know how many people in the audience saw that film, but I'm also the producer yeah. of Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace. So I've been blessed this year to have two films uh, hit theaters. Uh, Amazing Grace won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Documentary. And just recently, I was accepted into the Academy of uh, Arts of Motion Picture. So it's been a it's Absolutely. been a good year. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been a great year. And you know, just to, to add e even more, you've your your company has been involved in uh, Black Panther and and oh, yeah. you know countless of, films. Uh, Red Tails, Stump the Yard, uh, This Christmas, Race, uh, First Sunday, I could yeah. go on Precious. 
uh, again, we've touched so many films and I've been thankful to engage with them. Uh, but it's always tough. I want to tell you, I mean, for me, and th th this is a little story of how I even got into producing. Um, Black Panther is the reason why I produce films. And while Black Panther was is a great film and it did phenomenal numbers, over a billion dollars, the one thing that stuck with me is that none of the actors, none of the producers, nor the director was able to retire off that movie. So the movie made a significant amount of dollars. And I remember going to the theaters and I saw children dressed up as Black Panther and parents wearing uh, daishikis and African garb. And we, were, we, we really took pride in the film, but there was not one single African-American behind that film that reaped the financial rewards. And so I had a conversation with Tyler Perry in Atlanta. I'm based in Atlanta. And Tyler said something important to me. And I was actually at his studio, which if you ever get a chance to go to TPS, it is a magnificent place. Tyler said that a, a lot of us in the industry, we hammer a lot of nails to other people's houses. Yeah, yeah. But we don't own the house. And Tyler said, I own my house as I'm sitting on 330 acres that Tyler Perry owns in the middle of Atlanta. Yeah. And he said to me, he said, Terrell, while you do great at marketing so many films, um, I think it's time for you to start owning some of these films and being the producer. And that was really what convicted me to, to produce Amazing Grace and now Brian Banks. Yeah, yeah fantastic, fantastic. So my my daughter just last week or so we were 14 year she's 14 years old and she talked to me about never seeing me cry right and I told her it's not true I do cry um I said and silly enough I cry over movies um and she asked me well like what um I'm a coach I study coaching and I said something that involves sport when I see something ter terrific happen um really brings, it, it gets me. And this got me more than once. Um, I, I'm struck by, as a sociologist and just being a, you know, a black man, a husband, a father, uh, these moments where our young folks feel so hopeless, helpless, when they look out in this world and just say, I don't know that there's any hope for me. I don't see how this world is gonna change. Um, how difficult is it to be in this project and, and, and imagining the audience, right? There's, there's that piece of, you know, how much of this are, are they going to really absorb and take in, you know, when this, there's this struggle, right? This, how difficult is that? And how do you help to bring that to, to life? And what kind of decisions, I think, are, are around that? That's a great question. Well, a couple of things. I think you know, number one, I, I usually sit in the back when I screen the films and I like to watch reactions. Um, I know when the Facebook request comes over, usually there's a gas. Most few times I hear a lot of women being like, no, she didn't. <laughs> what? You know, and and even when he gets on the phone and she, you know, she starts talking, they like, mm, I hear all of that. And that. So it lets me know that people are dialed in, they're connected to the movie, that they haven't zoned out so far, that they don't really know really the, the impulse of what's happening. And the film has this excellent roller coaster ride that crescendos and it descends and climbs again. And every time you think Brian is getting ready to push forward, something happens that pushes him back. And so there's a few things. Number one, we were very careful not to uh, we didn't want to really paint Kanisha as an evil entity. And so we tried our hardest not to really criminalize or penalize her and what she went through. While at the same time, I was very, I was real intentional and all the producers were intentional not to have a white savior film. Mm -hmm. This is about Brian and his story and his desire uh, to be set free, not about someone that helped or, or, or took him or carried him across the finish line. As a matter of fact, Brian is the one that was pushing the entire way. 
So, you, and for your question, the thing that really gets me, and I, and I normally would, do, I'm gonna read you guys something. I normally wouldn't do this, but it really is because I've spent so much time with Brian. Yeah, yeah. So two days ago, and, and I would love if you guys would do this. Um, on Instagram, Brian's handle is at Brian Banks Free. And I would really encourage you to send him a note. You just saw the film. The film comes out this Friday. You can DM him. He would love to know what you think about his story and about the film. Um, so I would really love for you to do that. Uh, but Brian, two days ago, or maybe it's yesterday, yesterday, Brian put out a post and I told him, I said, Brian, this is the realest post I've ever seen on Instagram. He put out his ID from jail, which has his ID number. And I, I want to read this to you because and then I'll tell you what he told me because I asked him, why did he put this out? And it says you won't ever really know. You never truly understand being kidnapped at 16, caged like an animal for five years, having your name changed to a number, humiliated and degraded daily, manual labor at 12 cents an hour, watching your friends and some family go on to judge you, leave you, talk down on your name. You never truly understand what it's like to be traumatized, triggered, and made paranoid for life. To live life in fear of violence or a violent and lonely death while in prison, to be made a monster and vilified as a predator, to be called a rapist, failure, felon, convict, number V13109, to live your worst imaginable nightmare every day for 10 years straight, nonstop, a third of my life was forcefully taken by the system. There are those that can relate, and for that, I am sorry. I am so effing sorry. You know what it what these shoes feel like. We didn't deserve this. So as a person that lost their freedom, that it was really taken away from them, um, and to see Brian now, and spend time and watch his energy yeah. to help others, but also to walk with, uh, you know, his head held high with pride mm -hmm. um, is something really incredible. Yeah. This man went to his lowest lows, and and as some people know here, he he's now able to walk with kings. He yeah. keeps a calm in touch. Yeah. He has a movie. He just released a book. He has a fiance, a brand new baby, yeah. I think eight months old. And uh, and so now when you talk about living your best yeah, life, absolutely. yeah, he's in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as as Ken said, we got to meet Brian. And when you when you see this brother, you can't help but be touched. I mean, it's the lightness um, and the joy. You can tell he really is free. And that's you know, this. This was a, a, an amazing representation. Um, and we're so thankful that that you showed it. Uh, and helped us to, to bring this story to light. So I want to open it up for a Q&A. Um, make sure you all have a chance to ask Terrell any questions that you might have. Yeah, right in front. Hi, I'm so excited about it. I remember when this happened and um, when the news of his exoneration um, made the headlines. But I, I'm curious about what We just praying for her, but we want to make sure that um, I appreciate that you didn't vilify her. She actually did it well enough for herself. So, if but do you know whatever came of her? So uh, the accuser uh, effectively she went into hiding again. They were paid one point five million dollars, um, and after Brian was exonerated. Uh, the courts went back and then they uh, they tried a case to receive the money back and they won that. And so she now owes two point one million. But she is missing in act missing in action. They can't find her. Um, we we don't know what has happened to her. We imagine that with this film coming out, there's much broader awareness of the story. And 
who knows what will happen. But that school system, the Long Beach uh, independent school system, they still want their money. Now, <laughs> we all realize there's no way they're going to get it from this young lady. Uh, but um, but that's that's effectively where it is. Push the button. Very timely movie. Can you tell me how this will impact you moving forward as a producer and um, just the content, the message, and uh, all that you can control is, you know, you can't control life. Um, and I don't want to misquote what you said here, but how you respond to life. And can you just tell me how it affects you personally, how will it affect you with your future projects? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, for me, I'll start there personally. So yesterday I had a screening in Atlanta. Champ Bailey hosted a screening. I walked into this theater, didn't know what to expect. I knew there were going to be some football players, but they invited high school teams from across the city. So I walked into a theater of nothing but black boys, high school boys, all of them. And as I walked in, I said, I told these young men, I said, this is the most beautiful audience I have seen to date. And I began to go into why their presence was so critical and so important for this particular story. Now, I have two daughters, um, 17 and 15, but I also have two nephews. And I'm trying to help my daughters as well as young people know how easily they can slip. And one decision can change and alter your life for years. Brian was set to go to USC. He was, everyone knew he was going to be, he was going to go to the NFL. That's how good he was. He was one of the number one players in the country. And to have that stripped away so quickly and then to be locked away for 11 years really changed the tide. And so for me, number one, uh, for films, for me, you know, and, and as a producer, I like putting out films and our stories that have impact and that teach something, especially to young people. For example, when um, we worked on Red Tails and I got a chance to travel the country with Tuskegee Airmen, one pulled me aside and someone asked a question about you know, racism. And he said, hey, Terrell, you know what? The antidote to racism is excellence. Excellence can't be denied. You continue being excellent. You will overcome levels of racism. And I, I've thought about that so many times. And those are the kind of lessons that I learned when I engage with some of these films or when I was with Hank Aaron during 42. And he told these stories of how he had to be separated from his team while he was out chasing the home run title and how there were death threats on his life. But he had to continue to hit the ball. And his wife was the one, Billy Aaron was the one that said, you are going to become somebody for these young boys. Keep hitting because they need to see a black home run king. So for me, telling stories like that really matters. Um, and I, I'll do a comedy and I may do a sci fi show at some juncture. But um, these type of films cause impact. And, uh, and so it's opened up a, a, a door, numb, several doors for me to look at different films um, that I hope to bring forward. My next production is Respect, which is the Aretha Franklin biopic. And then after that, I do have Hammer, which is the Hank Aaron biopic. So I do, I like biopics, as you can tell. Um, and I like true life stories. I think there's something to be told when we, we can deliver our stories, especially to help our young people. And then maybe that's just the griot in me. I want to, this is my way to help keep those stories alive. Thank you so much for this project. Uh, it really means a lot to those of us who, who want to see, um, like you said, it's not a white savior story, to really want to see us push our way through to really uh, stand up for ourselves. It's really meaningful. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, as a screenplay writer and director for one of the short films here, because what you represent is exactly what some of us do want to do, how would someone like me get a project into your hands without it being um, strange for me to disrupt everyone? I'm very sorry, but I have to take advantage of this opportunity. How would someone like me or me exactly get? <laughs> no, you, well, let me tell you, I mean, um, 
listen, and, and, and you're doing the right thing. I've been in this industry now for 20 years, and um, uh, you have not if you ask not. You have to step forward and find bold ways to engage. Uh, but then there's also protocol. So I'm a, be a believer in protocol. Um, I, I'm more than happy to give you my assistance information. She'll connect you to my agents. Most things fall or kind of are filtered through Endeavor Content, WME, uh, which is my agency in, in LA. Um, and really, then there's a process that I follow, which is just to protect myself, but also to protect you and the art form itself. So, but you're doing the right thing is you, you, you know, our business is about relationship. So for me, I had to get out and meet people and shake hands and give out business card cards for, I guess, 19 years till I produced my first film. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, you know, this is, this is, this is where it starts by attending festivals like this, connecting with other filmmakers um, and then pressing forward through the protocol and the process. Thank you, sir. Um, good evening. A few months ago, I said, so my name is Andrea Lawful Sanders, and I write for the Philadelphia Sunday we, Sun. We don't see you. Oh, I'm all I the way up here. Okay, okay. go ahead. The tall I chocolate see sister in the back. I see you. Beautiful. So I write for the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, which is one of the few African-American uh, papers left in the country. And the, the publisher of the Sun is in the room with me tonight. And I, I have to tell you, a few months ago, I went to her and I said, listen, we keep talking about the Me Too movement, but no one's talking about the lies that bind, the men that are found guilty, that are completely innocent. And she listened and we wrote the article and it has reverberated. So here's my question to you. When are we going to do both and? Why do we always look at innocence guilty until proven innocent, that you have to, all these lies of this are destroyed to get to this place. Why did Brian have to go through this? Why aren't more of us speaking up on behalf of our young black men, especially when we know we live in a country where it's not always, not always, it's very rarely fair for them. How do we do that? How do we change that? I love that this movie exists, but it shouldn't have to happen. It shouldn't have to happen. And when I wrote the piece, they told me I was crazy that I, nothing would come of it. And to see this now, he's in the, the piece too, actually. So answer this question for me, please. Surely, I will be glad to do that. And number one, great article. I do remember the article. So I commend you as the writer and the publisher for pushing forward. I'll tell you this, from the film, and this is what we discuss uh, as we've been producing this film, it's really about what is the system. And the system is really made up of people, from the bailiff to the judge, to the attorneys, to the DAs, um, across the board, it's all about people and their interpretation of law. And so our belief and what Brian is pushing for, you know, he's pushing for legislation. I and the filmmakers are really trying to really be advocates for people really getting involved in the system and people that have a certain level of morals, that carry a certain level of values where the system can be modified. So we need to encourage our young people to become DAs to become great attorneys and judges, but at the same time instilling with them the right morals and values in holding those positions. So we think that you know modifying the system is one way, but we, so there's an internal system to change, but then there's external forces, that's legislation and other things that we do to really uh, combat the erroneous uh, 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 and the neglect that the system places on us as, as a society and a community. So hopefully that helps. You know, I don't know if that's a perfect answer, but that's the part that we play. And for us as filmmakers, putting out stories like this and creating awareness and just what the same thing that Ava DuVernay did with When They See Us, the same thing that uh, Michael B. Jordan is doing with his upcoming film. I think creating that level of awareness allows society and our general and general audiences to pay more attention to when these stories come up. Good evening. I want to thank you for being here. This was a wonderful experience. Um, my name is Marjorie Fuller. I'm the director of the Center for Black Culture and Research at West Virginia University. And I'm here with a group of students who have been enjoying this um, film festival greatly. Um, 
As the director of the center, we are supporters of the Innocence Project through our law school. I was wondering, is Brian going to be doing any touring to support the Innocence Project in places like West Virginia where it's really needed and other more rural areas where we don't always get this kind of hype? And the work that's been done there has been phenomenal. It is. So I recent, recently was at the uh, NBA, the National Bar Association, um, and Brian actually sits on the board of the California Innocence Project. So he currently does travel. He is a public speaker. Uh, that's his day in and day out. That's how he makes his money. Uh, he also recently wrote a book. And Brian will come to any place that will bring him out to speak to young people or to speak to other attorneys. We spoke to an entire theater filled of field of attorneys about the innocence project and the greatest i think you know moment in that conversation was afterwards we had three attorneys come up and say you know what i've never even considered donating my time uh, to the innocence project but i think this is something that would be really fulfilling for me so they we connected them that night uh with people that they could talk to so brian's willing to do that um, and then finally i'm so pleased that you have students here um, and I hope they enjoyed the film. I really do. I need them on Instagram and on Twitter. We open up August 9th. Let all your friends know. Uh, hit Brian up at, at Brian Banks Free. You can send me a note at, at Terrell Whitley. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm encouraged whenever I see young people in the audience. Good evening. Okay. Thank you for your work. Um, I've worked in this field for a little over 20 years and I don't mean to pile anything else on, but I wanted to ask about uh, if you've thought about moving into what really happens in our prison system. I, I agree that we need to understand how they get there and that it's profoundly unfair, but we are one of the few nations that has a completely opaque system. We have no idea what goes on in our system. And I wondered if you thought about telling that part of the story. Um, interesting, I actually have. Um, I recently, I was telling a couple of my friends here uh, that uh, that are in Martha's Vineyard and hanging out, they showed me around today. I was recently in Bali and Singapore. And in Singapore, I was pulled aside before we, this is literally on our drive from the airport to the hotel. They said, hey, the driver said, hey, let me tell you a little bit about our rules here in Singapore. And he says, so listen, if you, you, you can't chew gum, he said, if you litter, there's, it's a $300 fine the first time and a warning. Second time, you go bef be before a judge and it's $1,000. If the judge finds you to be in contempt or and or if they convict you of it, then you spend three additional days, you pay more money, and you wear a jacket, and we send you to the dirtiest part of Singapore, you clean it up and we call the media out to take pictures of you. If you use drugs or sell drugs in Singapore, you can be hung. And for, for, other, for other actions, he said, we'll take you out, we'll whip you. And I said, man. And I, he said, listen, I just want you to understand, Singapore laws have bite that you guys don't have in the United States. And there are deterrents to keep you from doing these things in our country. When I heard that, and, and my wife and I, we enjoy it. Singapore is beautiful. It is a very clean place. <laughs> my wife said, as we were shopping, she said, Terrell, there's no pigeons. And she said, there's no gum on the ground and there's no trash. She, I mean, she literally was amazed. We had never seen anything like it. So what it made me think of is these differences in culture tied to prisons. And so when you look at the offenses, and especially with what we just recently experienced with gun violence, with these mass shootings, and what happens in other countries, what I'm thinking about now is why is our culture, why do we allow these things almost I almost feel like we incite them because we're so passive and our laws and our legislation have become so greedy that they rather take money 
over saving lives. So yes, the short answer, that was a long answer, but the short answer is yes, I have thought about it. I am looking at it. Um, I'm interested in stories and narratives about it, but I'm really trying to get to the root of what it is about us. Um, someone recently, I can't remember where I saw it, uh, maybe it was on, on online, but they said, this is us, this is what we're doing. And but we, we talk about it as if it's other people, but it's us. And so how are we gonna change what's happening in our society and how that impacts the prisons? The prison system right now is about money. It's not even about people. It's about money, it's a business. Um, so I think that needs to be addressed. One last question. One last question. Anybody? Okay. Thank you again for bringing the film to the festival. It's been quite uh, emotional, but also needed. You mentioned that you asked Brian why he wrote that uh, post. Could you tell us what he said? Uh, yeah, so I didn't say that part. So I called Brian. I said, Brian, hey, man, it's the realest post. I said, brother, well, why did you put that out there? And he said, Terrell, you guys have had me on interviews and all around the country for the last few months. And so this is like a fresh wound that is wide open for me. He's and, and I thought about it, I was like, you know, if you took my darkest days, you put them on film and then you started playing it over and over and over again. And then you threw me in front of cameras and people ask me the same questions over and over and over again. It really is the freshest of wounds. And so he was really, um, he was actually getting ready to fly from New York back to LA. And he's like, man, I'm so glad that the movie is coming out this week because I can't do another week. Um, like his, his mother is doing interviews now. He's like, his mom is really emotional. He, he has trouble watching scenes that Sherry Shepard, who does a magnificent job. This is her first dramatic role. Yeah, yeah. Sherry, um, whenever Sherry's on screen, he's like, I have to turn my head because he knows the sacrifice that his mother went through. And uh, Brian, Aldis, and I, we have our own little um, group text. And Aldis chimed in. He was like, man, we both feel for you because we know that you're out here pressing hard. And Aldis does a magnificent job as well, um, portraying Brian. But I think Brian, you know, for someone that has lived it, we're telling the, and you know, we're telling the story. But he walked the walk, and so he. Uh, that's and the post for him was healing. He was like, you know, people really think they know. He's like, they have no clue. He's like, and the movie gives you a little insight, but you really, really don't know. Um, and so I think that's that's where his head is. And that's why I ask, I mean, I'm, and I'm serious about this. Send Brian a note. Like, tell him what you think about the movie. That actually is a part of healing for him. When he gets messages, when I go to screenings, he'll say, hey, you just did it. He'll send me a note. Did you just do a screen? I said, yeah. He's like, Man, I just got 20 DMs. And people were telling me how much they love the story and the movie and you know, pray for me and this and that. And so that's why uh, I say that. If you if you want the you know, best thing you do for me is tell everybody about the movie. Now, if you like the movie, please get on Instagram, get on social. If you didn't like the movie, don't say nothing. Please <laughs> don't say a single word. Just be quiet. But if you liked it, say something uh, and then go one step further. Send Brian a note. Um, that I think that would be that's healing for him at this moment. Give, yeah, sure, give it to him. Sure. Again. So uh, it's at Brian Banks Free. That's to Brian directly. Uh, the movie is at Brian Banks Movie, and then my handle is at Terrell Whitley. T i r r e l l w h i t t l e y. It's a whole bunch of double letters in there. And that and that's Brian Brian B R I A N B A N K S F R E. That's correct. That's it. Sure, it's it's at T 
T-I-R-R-E-L-L. Then it's W-H-I-T-T-L-E-Y. I think almost every letter is a double letter, <laughs> except that Y. Intention. Yeah. For sure. yeah. So thank you all. I, again, the film opens up this Friday nationwide. Um, we are very hopeful. Of course, uh, Hobbs and Shaw is still in theater. Lion King is still in theater. The Kitchen opens up. Uh, but we're hopeful that audiences will go out. Uh, we're really trying to get in front of women right now. We think men have seen it on ESPN. They're being connected through NFL, a lot of stuff we're doing with the NFL. But we want women and specifically young boys, high school boys, high school girls. I've taken my girls. Um, I would encourage you, if you have a Lynx group, an AKA, if you're part of the Deltas, a sorority, a fraternity, I know there's some alpha men in here. I'm sure there's a Kappa or two. Um, Please, <laughs> that's a little shade. It's all good. Um, definitely take some groups out. I'm a member of the 100 Black Men. I've also spoken to the Boule. I'm asking them to really engage with folks. Now here, and, and can I say this one final thing? Um, I literally, while I was sitting here, a member of the, the, the National Bar Association, she sent me a note saying, hey, Terrell, I did a theater bout. Um, I think she's in Charlotte. And she said that they... The theater told her to have people go on and just pick any movie and they'll know that it's for Brian Banks. And I told her, absolutely not. I said, I'm glad you called me. I'm going to jump into this right away. I said, it's important that they have to select Brian Banks. Otherwise, we will not get the credit. And I'm, and I'm glad that her radar was on and she said, this doesn't feel right. So she sent me a text directly, copied Ben Crump. So Ben Crump is on it right now. So we got a civil rights attorney on this. So this is, it's about to get serious. But I just want, I, I say that to encourage you to just check your movie tickets. This is the games that are played within our industry. Thank you again so much, Terrell. We hope to, to find other ways to, to work together and bring you back out again. Let's give, uh, give one, another round of applause.